I think this is a mosquito larva. It's from a bucket of standing water that my housemate had outside. I oppose leaving standing water outside because it breeds invertebrates, which brings animals into existence without their consent and forces them to endure often painful deaths a few weeks or months later. Standing water also drowns insects that get trapped inside the water bucket or container. Unfortunately, my housemate leaves containers outside to trap rainwater for watering plants. I try to cover these containers to keep insects from getting in, but I'm not always successful at doing so, as this video proves. Here's a bucket of standing water that contains a few types of organisms. I think the thicker ones in the lower half of the screen are mosquito larvae. This footage was taken on 12 August, 22 September, and 28 September 2016 at my house in a rural area near Albany, New York, USA. According to Wikipedia, quote, the mosquito larva has a well-developed head with mouth brushes used for feeding, a large thorax with no legs, and a segmented abdomen. Larvae breathe through spiracles located on their eighth abdominal segments, or through a siphon, so must come to the surface frequently. The larvae spend most of their time feeding on algae, bacteria, and other microbes in the surface microlayer. They dive below the surface only when disturbed. Larvae swim either through propulsion with their mouth brushes, or by jerky movements of their entire bodies, giving them the common name of wigglers or wrigglers. Larvae develop through four stages or instars, after which they metamorphose into pupae. At the end of each instar, the larvae molt, shedding their skins to allow for further growth." End quote. This page says, quote, Mosquito larvae are extremely sensitive and will submerge for protection if they sense disturbance. Water that has been stagnant for three days is a prime habitat for mosquitoes. Some species require minimal amounts of water to thrive. Even water sources such as bird baths are potential breeding sites." End quote. This page says, quote, Mosquito larvae commonly called wigglers, live in water from 4 to 14 days, depending on water temperature. Larvae are constantly feeding since maturation requires a huge amount of energy and food. They hang with their heads down and the brushes by their mouths, filtering anything small enough to be eaten toward their mouths to nourish the growing larvae. They feed on algae, plankton, fungi and bacteria, and other microorganisms. They breathe at the water surface with the breathing tube up, breaking the water surface tension." End quote. This study says, quote, All mosquitoes have aquatic larvae, and the majority of these live at the surface of the water. They lie most of the time with their respiratory siphon penetrating the surface film, and their spiracular system open to the atmosphere. If a shadow passes over the water, or if some mechanical disturbance takes place, e.g. stamping the feet on the ground near a pool, or tapping the edge of a dish in the laboratory, the larvae usually disappear from the surface. This disappearance has been called the alarm reaction, after a period which may differ for different species of mosquitoes, the larvae again return to the surface. It is well known that although mosquito larvae react strongly to stimuli, such as shadows and shocks, if these are frequently repeated, stimulus satiation or releaser satiation occurs, and the insects cease to react. This was observed with the three species used in this investigation. 
a change in the rhythm of the stimuli gave a strong reaction. Thus, if the dish were tapped four times a second for five minutes, complete recovery was obtained, and the larvae behaved as if no stimulus were being given. If the rate of tapping was then slowed down to one tap per second, a rate at which, had it continued from the start, recovery would have already been complete, a strong alarm reaction took place. If larvae which had recovered with a rapidly repeated stimulus were given no further stimulus for 15 seconds, a tap after that interval gave a strong reaction once more. But just stopping tapping did not cause a reaction. The following experiment showed that the larvae ceased to give the alarm reaction due to satiation to a particular stimulus, and not because of fatigue. A container with larvae was tapped once a second for four minutes. The larvae, by the end of the period, had returned to the surface. The stimulus was continued, but at the same time the hand was passed once over the surface of the water. The larvae immediately gave the alarm reaction. The same result was obtained when, after four minutes satiation to the visual stimulus, the dish was given a single tap. The larvae all disappeared from the surface. This is presumably related to survival. If stimulus satiation did not occur, the larvae might be always on the move and would be unable to feed or respire normally. On the other hand, reaction to changes in the tempo of stimulation or in the nature of the stimulus may normally be associated with some new hazard to the larvae." End quote. Here I poked a pen into the cup holding the mosquito larvae. You can see that when the larvae are disturbed, they become motionless for a short period. This paper says, quote, Previous work, Ferrari et al., unpublished data, demonstrated that larval mosquitoes show one of two anti-predator responses to a variety of predation cues, including alarm cues from injured conspecifics and the odor of salamanders. The mosquitoes either dramatically increase their number of wriggle movements, representing fleeing behavior, or dramatically decrease their number of wriggle movements, representing freezing behavior. When they are exposed to control cues, the mosquitoes exhibit little change in movements. Freezing behavior should make mosquito larvae less conspicuous and hence increase their chance of survival. Mosquito larvae might also increase their chances of survival by actively swimming to a refuge, like aquatic plants. It is still unknown whether freezing and fleeing behaviors are behavioral phenotypes, a mosquito that freezes will always freeze, and a mosquito that flees will always flee in response to predation cues, or is under control of the mosquito larvae that might choose which behavior to display." End quote. This study says in its introduction, quote, to be successful, prey individuals have to adaptively balance the costs of predator avoidance with the benefits of foraging and reproducing, both in terms of time and energy. An effective way to maximize this trade-off is for prey to respond to predators with an intensity that matches the level of threat posed by the predator. This phenomenon has been demonstrated in a variety of taxa and is known as the threat-sensitive predator avoidance hypothesis. A prerequisite for prey to respond to predators, however, is for them to be able to recognize those threatening species. The first alternative is for prey to possess an innate recognition of at least some of their potential predators. This means predator-naive prey would display an anti-predator response when exposed to cues from novel predators for the first time. However, many prey species do not show an innate recognition of their potential predators. Hence, learning is necessary for them to acquire this information. 
Prey can learn to associate the stimulus from a novel species with danger in a number of ways, including through direct experience with the predator. In aquatic species, individual prey often learn to recognize a novel predator stimulus as a threat when this stimulus is paired with injured conspecific cues. Such learning is particularly well studied in fishes, but has also been documented in larval amphibians and a variety of invertebrates, snails, damselflies, flatworms, and crayfish. Ferrari et al. 2005 demonstrated that learning to recognize predators through pairing with alarm cues not only allows the prey to learn to recognize the predator as a threat, but it may also allow the prey to learn the level of risk associated with the threat. Indeed, they showed that fathead minnows learn to recognize the odor of a novel brook trout after a single pairing of alarm cues paired with brook trout odor, and that the minnows subsequently displayed a response to brook trout odor alone with an intensity that matches the intensity displayed during the conditioning periods. The minnows learned to respond strongly to the trout if it was paired with a high concentration of alarm cues, and learned to respond weakly to the trout if it was paired with a low concentration of alarm cues. This phenomenon is referred to as threat-sensitive learning. End quote. Here are the paper's results. The larvae wriggle less the more alarmed they are about predation risk. The paper's discussion reports, quote, The results of this experiment clearly show that mosquito larvae learn to recognize the odor of a novel predator after a single conditioning event, and hence are consistent with results of experiments done on other taxa. Indeed, the response intensity of mosquitoes conditioned with any concentration of alarm cues subsequently responded with a higher response intensity to salamander odor alone when compared to the control group. When looking at the response of mosquitoes during the conditioning phase, it is important to notice that the response intensity increased when exposed to increasing concentrations of crushed conspecific cues. This phenomenon establishes that mosquitoes exhibit threat-sensitive responses to crushed conspecific cues. The most interesting result of our study is that mosquito larvae have the ability to learn to respond to novel predator cues in a threat-sensitive manner, and this ability is established based on a single conditioning trial. Indeed, we found that there was no difference in the intensity of response recorded during the conditioning period and the testing period. To our knowledge, only one study has demonstrated threat-sensitive learning in another aquatic prey. Ferrari et al. 2005 showed that fathead minnows learned to recognize brook trout in a threat-sensitive manner. While this level of sophistication is impressive in a fish species, it is even more impressive in an invertebrate species that may spend less than two weeks of its life in an aquatic environment." End quote.